The structure of the Bible is absolutely amazing. And here to talk about the structure of the Bible is a uh, young man from Australia. His name is Steve Ciccolante. And Steve, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. Oh, it's amazing to be here. This is like prophecy heaven. And, and by the way, we're go going to be talking about uh, a couple of books that he's put together, volumes one and two. Uh, they're called The Divine Code, and they speak about the numerical structure of Scripture. Now, we don't talk about scriptural numerics very often, although uh, many Christians have written about the subject over the last century, century and a half, or going back even farther than that. And I, I think it's a legitimate study. What brought you to write a book about uh, the numerical structure of the Bible? I wasn't really starting out to write a book about numbers, but as I uh, studied many different topics, the numbers came out. So. One of the first uh, numbers I probably saw was the fact that Jesus talked about the parable of the four soils, or mm -hmm. the parable of the sower, and it's clearly a numerical teaching. He says that when the seed, which is the Word of God, is sown, uh, it goes into four different soils. So that means that you've got 25% of each kind. And he says that only one produces 30, 60, to 100 fold. So then he divides the 25% by 3, that makes 8.33%. And then he says that only one group produces a hundredfold. So I always saw from the beginning numbers everywhere when Jesus taught. Hmm. And then it just, you know, then when, once you get into prophecy and end times, the Bible gives us clues that we are supposed to look at certain periods, certain cycles, three and a half years, seven years. It has... Uh, in 42 months, in 1,260 days. It even mentions the Antichrist has a number associated with him, 666. So it's very clear that the Bible is actually leading us to understand that God made the numbers, and they point to him. They don't point to our fortune, they point to him. Now, your book, The Divine Code, uh, Volume 1, goes through the numbers 1 through 25, and then Volume 2, 26 and onward, and you talk about each number, the way, the way that particular number is used in Scripture. This has been done before, but I don't think uh, anybody has ever covered the sub subject as deeply as you have. So let's just talk about a couple of three numbers, give people an idea of what you do. What, what's your favorite number? If I just had to say, talk about a number, what would it be? Well, my favorite topic is really Jesus. So it's not just any, any particular number, but all the numbers that that lead us to a relationship with the Lord, I think it's very interesting. And I think that Christians need to understand, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says that for Jews uh, require or demand a sign, but Greeks seek after wisdom. So we often don't pay attention to signs. We like wisdom. But the Jews and, and a Hebraic understanding of the Bible is fascinated about numbers. And they study the Bible in a way that's a little bit different from the way we do. So it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just that when you can find uh, Jesus in the numbers, it's very convincing to the Jews. And I know at least a couple of Jews who have just studied the numbers and came to faith, came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah just through the numbers. I'm opening your book here to uh, the number two, and, and you say two is the number of union. Jesus has two na uh, natures, divine and human. Light has two natures, wave and particle. Bible has two testaments, old and new. Humanity needs two members, male and female. That's why you start that chapter. And then you go on and on and on from there. And, f and this is the way his entire book is structured. It, it, it sort of logically looks, or I would say almost in a casual way, you look at the way numbers are used and point us back to Scripture, which I, is, I find very exciting. Yeah, so it's not academic. It's not so theological and technical. It really is just how would numbers apply to your life? Everybody sees numbers every day, and some, some people see numbers repeatedly. Well, what do those things mean? Now here you, you not only have the, the number one, as you open his first volume, you have, not only have the number one, but you have the number, the, the next chapter, 1.618. Why 1.618? Well, 
I understand that because I, I love to study numbers myself. And that's called the golden ratio, 1.618. And in the Bible you discover that the, uh, the golden ratio is applicable to some things you find there. That's right, like the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Mosaic Ark, even Noah's Ark, it has that ratio for perfect stability. It was perfectly suited to be a vessel that would you know, keep eight people and all those animals safe during the global flood. So who would have known that? I mean, in terms of engineering, aesthetics, of course, God would have known that. So the numbers point us straight to him. Yeah, and who would even take the time to think, well, the golden ratio is applied to Noah's Ark or to the Ark of the Covenant. But again, 1.618, if you're a mathematician, is a very important number. It's a, it's, it is an integer that is used in many, many, many engineering applications, for example. And you go to the Great Pyramid and you discover, wow, <clears throat> it, has, it is built to the ratio of 1.618, which is called the golden ratio. And you even find it in the Bible. So, and his, so he's got a chapter here, 1.618, which I find uh, uh, fascinating. The next chapter, 2. 2 is the number of union. Let's talk about 2 for a minute, being the number of union and also division. Oh, every number is special, but this number particularly points to, to the Lord. He's the second person of the Godhead. There are uh, two testaments in the Bible. There are actually two calendars that God gives the people of, of Israel. So there's the civil calendar, the religious calendar, the Genesis calendar, and the Exodus calendar. Hmm. But what's interesting is when you go to science, you find that uh, light actually can uh, be tested or exhibited in two different natures, two different ways. It can be wave or it can be particle, and yet it's the same thing. Hmm. And that directly points to the mystery of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. How is it that something can be wave and particle at the same time? Well, how can Jesus be God and human at the same time? Hmm. And this is one of the mysteries, but God has chosen to come down and redeem us by sending his own son to be born as a man. And this mystery of the, kind of like the dual nature of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua, is you know, it's hinted at and it's understood by the rabbis because they expect that there will be a Messiah, Ben Joseph, and a Messiah, Ben David. So why is that? Because they see two natures of the Messiah. They see a suffering servant, and yet they see a conquering king. And they can't reconcile that, so they just think it's two different people. And yet with the revelation of the New Testament, we realize, no, that, that's combined in one person, but he's coming in two different comings. So he came the first time as Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. He suffered for your sin and my sin, but he's coming again a second time as the conquering, conquering king. So it's, it's amazing how just even the number two can point so much to our Lord Jesus. You talk about two being a number associated with dreams, and you say that Pharaoh was given two dreams, and uh, also uh, we have uh, the book of Daniel with two dreams given to Daniel. Yes. Two lay out a prophetic profile or a prophetic, a prophetic destiny of some sort. Let's talk about that a minute. Yeah, so um, dreams, you know, everyone has dreams. How do you know if it's really from God? God usually confirms it. So he confirmed it to Pharaoh, he confirmed it to Joseph, he confirmed it to Daniel, and it can even be two different people. Uh, as in the case of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar had one dream that had the same meaning with the statue, and then he had a different dream, but with the same meaning, seeing the four different kinds of beasts. So God will do that. You know, He's very kind, very gracious. So when you get dreams, if you're not sure, God can confirm it. And this has happened in our ministry. Uh, even recently we had somebody, I talk a lot about Donald Trump because I predicted that he was going to win and uh, before he was even a Republican nominee. And we just recently had one of our staff members had a dream about Donald Trump and then I had that, like a similar dream. So there was this confirmation that I'm supposed to do something about this. Donald Trump, uh, a, uh, a riddle and an enigma. <laughs> because a lot of people say, oh, he's a crude, rough, tough guy, you know, a builder, a millionaire, has a background of, uh, mm, from the Christian perspective, he has a kind of a rough, roughshod background. He's on the outer edge. But Christians seem to say God has brought him for this hour. I hear this all the time. What's your take on that? It's a lot of patterns in terms of numbers. 
you know, um, numbers are objective, they're neutral. So there's a lot of patterns that confirm that he's, he's the end time president, that he's here for a reason. And that's not a comment about his morality or his past. You know, that's, that's up to each individual whether you want to make a judgment on that. But uh, if I just let the numbers lead me, I just see so many patterns. One of them is the, the very uh, prophetic end time number is 58. 58 is associated with uh, Donald Trump. Um, it was associated with actually uh, George Washington. Uh, it's a small clue, but he always sat in pew 58 at his church. <laughs> and why is 58 important? Well, because uh, the word uh, Noah, the name Noah, actually spells 58. And 58 spells Noah. It's the same word because in Hebrew, letters are numbers, numbers are letters. So Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Hmm. So what, what does that mean? That means we should study everything about the days of Noah and what is this clue that God is giving. And one of the things is, in the Hebrew, if you read it, it would say, as in the days of 58. And President Trump, in his first term, was, was inaugurated in the 58th inauguration. So it's the 58th term, even though he's the 45th president. It's just one of those things that are clues. It's not something that he could have any control over. But we who are uh, studying the Bible and understand the meaning of the word Noah, that alone tells us that there's something beyond what man sees is going on here. So you think a little window is being opened for us to have discernment? Yes. And your whole book is, is built around the, uh, observations like this. Yes. Uh, anything else on, the, on that note before we... I want to look at the number three because everybody knows of the biblical number three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so forth and so on. But any, anything, any other note on the number two or, or the number 58 for that matter? Oh, uh, 58. Uh, it's very exciting because 58 gives us a clue uh, how soon uh, would the second coming be or how close we are to the end time. This one you have to look uh, into the book of Enoch, which is extra biblical, so you don't, you know, you're not obligated to believe it, but Jude quotes the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch, I found a very interesting prophecy about the end time. I just want to uh, look that up for you. Let me find it in, in this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There's this fascinating prophecy in the first book of Enoch. So when I say Enoch, by the way, I don't mean the second or the third book of Enoch. I think they're spurious, but I think that there's some historical uh, validity to the first book of Enoch. In chapter 90, it says this, I watched till in this manner the 35 shepherds pastured the sheep, and they each completed their period, as did the first, one after the other, each shepherd in his own period. Verse 5, I watched the next 23 shepherds pastured, but when they completed their periods, they had pastured 58 times. Hmm. And when you look at the, you know, the, the, the pastor is actually the word for a leader. These are the leaders of Israel. These are the mm -hmm. rulers. And so I started doing the count. He divided 58 into two groups, 35 shepherds and then 23 shepherds. Hmm. Well, I counted from Rehoboam, which is from the beginning of the split kingdom after Solomon. I counted from Rehoboam to Simon bar Kokhba. And there were exactly 35 Jewish rulers. So that fulfills the first part of Enoch's prophecy of 35 shepherds. And then obviously we know that Israel's dispersed, it goes into diaspora, and then it comes back in 1948. So I was curious, well, how do you count the last 23 shepherds? Because they no longer have a king. It's not the same, you know, dynastic rule anymore. Yeah. So I looked it up and there are three ways that you can count it. There Either you count by the number of prime ministers, uh, or Knesset sessions, or the executive governments when they form the government. Now, there have been 35 uh, governments already, so that doesn't qualify. There have been 12 prime ministers, um, unlike in the United States where the president would have either one term or two or three mm -hmm. consecutive terms uh, in the past. Um, they can come in non-consecutively. So there have been 12, and Benjamin Netanyahu is now 12. So if we're looking for another 23 uh, prime ministers, then that's going to give a pretty long timeline. But the interesting thing is, we are in the 21st Knesset session, and we should have had the 22nd, except Benjamin Netanyahu failed to form government. So that means that they're going to go back into re-election. They give themselves three months, and then on September uh, 17, there'll be a re-election. 
because they failed to form government. That would be the 22nd Knesset. Now, how far then are we away from, from the ultimate end time fulfillment of the Book of Enoch? It could be very close because he said there'll be 23 shepherds. So it depends how you count, whether you count the Knesset, which is really now the ruler of Israel, or do you count the prime minister, and there's been 12. I just think these, these numbers are very exciting because the fact that 35 was so exact, so accurate in the ancient time, why wouldn't the 23 be accurate in the modern time? So in the true sense of the word, you are a prophecy watcher. I am. I am. <laughs> just, I am watching and praying. <laughs> you can't keep from doing it. And, and that's the sense that I get when I read your book. And, and that, that's quite an excursion, by the way. I, and I read the book, folks, and uh, the whole, all, all, the, all of his writing, both volumes, one and two, are, are like that. If you hear him speak right now, you've kind of noticed the way he puts things together, the way he expresses himself. Well, that's the book. Let's go to the number three for a minute. Now, <clears throat> if I said to somebody, anybody uh, that knows anything at all about the Bible, what, what, where do you find the number three in the Bible? Somebody would have to say, well, the Trinity, of course. And but So I pick up your book on the number three and I read, the Trinity made all the elements on the periodic table out of three elementary particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And you begin to talk about creation. Yes. And three. And quite unique. I was very interested in this. Yeah, I think, look, if you study science and, and you don't find Christ in it, then you've missed the whole subject. You study numbers and you don't see Christ, you, you really haven't understood it. So three, even the very fact that we're living on the third planet has been pre-designed by God. It's his fingerprint that hmm. he is a trinity. And many, many religions either deny, atheism is to me a kind of religion that denies that God right. exists. And other religions say God is one, but, but there's no relationship there. There's no Godhead, just, just one alone. But the Bible reveals that he's three. And so we find three everywhere. You know, we live in three physical dimensions. All the elements are made of three subatomic particles, you know, the proton, neutron, and electron. We live in three time dimensions, or we refer to three time dimensions, past, present, and future. I just think this, this three, this fingerprint of three that shows the Trinity is the creator, is just everywhere that you look. And your chapter on three uh, takes that and runs with it. You go much farther than yes. <laughs> you talk about mitochondrial DNA. You say there are three types of mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA, and you go from there into the human body and the structure of the human body. Of course, it did not evolve; it was created. And why not? Why wouldn't you find the number three? That's right. It's, it's everywhere. And so, again, you just have to read this book, but, but it's phenomenal the way he, he's, he, I think he's been given a particular way of looking at life in, in terms of, of uh, numbers, like 3.5. You have a chapter here titled 3.5. Who would do that? And your first sentence in, the, in this chapter is uh, three and a half is half of seven. Well, everybody thinks seven. That's a wonderful biblical number. And three and seven would be, I think, recognizable by virtually anybody as biblical numbers. But wait a minute, three and a half, half of seven. Only you would put that, uh, that first sentence in, in your it's, it's very important, three and a half, because the disciples had three and a half years with Jesus. Jesus had only three and a half years to redeem the world, and he impacted it more than any other human being that ever lived to, you know, you compare with Buddha, for instance, Buddha had, I came from a Buddhist country, born in a Buddhist country, and he, he had 40 years to change the world. And at the end of his life, he had actually lamented that he could not influence more people. Until today, it's mainly recognized as an Eastern religion. But Jesus had three and a half years, no internet, no printing press, no political power. And in three and a half years, he completely changed the world. And three and a half years comes back again in the end time. We see uh, that, that division of three and a half years repeated in the book of Revelation. So it's very important, and I think the book says that the meaning of it is preparation. I have here on page uh, 112, and that probably means something to you, the way you <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but, but the number seven is the heartbeat of Scripture. You say, well, I think 
you wouldn't be telling anybody anything they didn't already know. Seven, and, and the Bible almost go hand in hand everywhere you think of sevens. And seven as a, a number of, if you have seven of anything, it completes a thought. Right. So let's talk about the number seven. Uh, I, I noticed you have seven and history here, which I found fascinating. Yes. It has, has to do with seven days of creation. <clears throat> you bring it up to seven continents, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, and, and so forth. Uh, 1917, you talk about. 1973, you talk about. In other words, you begin to, to focus in on Israel and the sevens there. Seven is the number of completion, and it's something that's beyond human interference, human uh, you know, uh, orchestration. For instance, we did not even know at the time that the Bible was written that there are seven continents. I don't know if they knew that there was Antarctica, but they certainly didn't know that there was North and South America. Well, how come we live on a planet where there's exactly seven continents, seven big land masses? Hmm. Uh, there are seven oceans as well. So the 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 creator who made this world has written only one book that is replete with patterns of seven, or it's called in Greek, heptatic patterns. And I put in just a, a page after that, or a couple of pages after that, I show you how many things are repeated or mentioned seven times. L listen to this. Okay. Uh, God says that he's the first and the last seven times. There are seven people who are named or called a man of God in the Old Testament. There are seven Old Testament writers that are named in the New Testament. Now how would this be possible? Because that would mean that you'd have to coordinate each of those authors who often lived in different places at different times, mm -hmm. and you have to say, you just mentioned him once, you mentioned this other person twice, and then when we count the complete canon of the Bible, you will find seven repeated again and again. And of course that didn't happen. These people were inspired by God, and we can see that the Bible has come down through the miraculous hand of God. There are seven named prophetesses in the Bible. So you just go from Genesis to Revelation and you count the number of prophetesses and it's exactly that seven. And the seven is most outstanding when it relates to Jesus. Jesus just, you know, the, the seven feasts of Israel point to Jesus. Jesus came and he taught seven parables. When you open the book of Revelation, he gives seven letters to seven churches and each letter has seven parts. So seven is pointing to Jesus. He's perfect. He's complete. That's why he's our savior. It's, uh, again, quite amazing the, the way uh, uh, Steve has put this book together. I wouldn't have thought of it. I don't think this way. I, I do uh, approve, I think, as a pastor teacher in the Bible, I approve of the study of number in Scripture. A lot of people bulk at it, say, oh, that's, that's a little bit far out for me. I don't know. Have you ever been, uh, have, have you ever met someone who was a little resistant to the idea of number in Scripture? Sure, sure. I mean, there are people resistant to every teaching and doctrine in the Bible, but the good news is, you know, the book's been out and um, it hit number one on Amazon for a few weeks. So I know for sure that there's a hunger out there for people to understand numbers in a biblical way. So we want to differentiate biblical uh, study of numbers from what maybe the world might, might um, call it numerology. We're not looking at numbers to point to our fortune, right? We're not looking at numbers and thinking, okay, maybe that's the winning lottery combination. That's not how we look at it. We look at numbers as how does it point us to a greater relationship with God, to an understanding of who the Messiah is. That's really the, the, the secret of these numbers. The patterns are there to point us to Him. It's an exciting thing to do when you discover that there's a, a connection. Suddenly uh, the work of the Lord becomes more real. It's not imaginary or it's not boring. It, it gets exciting when you, when you see these connections. I, I surprised Steve with one that he didn't know. And that is uh, the 153 fish in the Gospel of John that they caught. Yes. Now why would you count and come up with that odd number, 153 fish? But I told him something that he hadn't already known. The, the word Zion in the Bible is used 153 times. Coincidence or not? Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's, <laughs> that's a clue that you found. Zion is there 153 times and the amount of fish that they caught was 153. I think that's an end time clue that 
the end time harvest has to include the Jews coming back to recognize their Messiah. And we're there. And we're there. And we're by the way, close. your book is, is rather uh, well balanced when it comes uh, to talking about the Jews and, and prophecy that concerns Israel uh, as well as looking at the church and the prophecy that concerns the church. So you, you, you sort of go both directions. I think it's really important that Christians are balanced because the Bible is balanced. You know, the Bible has Old and New Testament and the Bible has both law and grace. It's very important that we understand now that there are different ways that people will find Christ. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, the scripture that I opened uh, today's session with, uh, let me just remind the audience that the Bible says, or Paul said, that the Jews require a sign, but Greeks seek after wisdom. So we have to have a balance of these two ways by which different people groups can find Jesus Christ. And it's not always one way. So I think as Gentiles, we prefer, most Gentiles or with, with Greek education, prefer wisdom, knowledge, science, learning. That's what we prefer. And then we say we find God that way. But there's a whole group of other people who say, no, we want to, we want to have signs. We want to have confirmations. And when we hear that word sign in the New Testament, we, as Protestants, we usually think of miracles, signs, and wonders. Because we say that in three, miracles, mm -hmm. signs, and wonders. Yeah. But the original Greek word is actually simeon. Simeon is not just miracles, signs, and wonders. It's a mark or a token that distinguishes one person from another. So a sign can distinguish, well, who is the Messiah? And the book of Revelation says there's a sign that's been given to distinguish the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist. It's 666. So it's important that we, we allow God to reach all different groups of people in all different ways. And it's not like one way is right or my way is right. There are so many ways and, and all of this points to God, whether it's wisdom, whether it's numbers and signs. Today I wanted to get to the number 22, which is very, has a great deal of interest for me personally. Uh, as a student of the Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew language, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. They act as letters, they also act as numbers. That's exactly right. So that's a clue right there that God is saying, pay attention to 22. 22 is especially a number for the Jews. And it's a number of end times. Not only are there 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but uh, the time of Jacob's trouble was actually, did you know, 22 years. Hmm. He suffered for 22 years. Then the time of Joseph's trouble was also 22 years, counting from the time that he was thrown down the well to the time when the brothers finally came, two years into the famine, and they bowed down to him without recognizing him at first. So 22 keeps appearing. Uh, did you realize even when Israel became a nation in 1948, even that 1948 it's, uh, can be calculated as a 22. It's 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 8, 22. So that's, <laughs> that's reduced, that's called reduced gematria. So yeah. everywhere you can see 22. I had not thought of that at all. 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 8, 22. Okay, you've got me going now. And then, and then you've got the book of Revelation. How many chapters yeah. are there? 22. 22. So it's the number of the Jews. It's the number of end times. That alone gives you a macro clue that the book of Revelation is written primarily to the Jews. That's why it's a mystery to many Gentile Christians, because it has to do with end time. It has to do with the tribulation. Now, I found something interesting that you might like, especially for the American audiences. Um, the Russian collusion investigation lasted 22 months. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. 22 months. So, and Mueller delivered his report to the Attorney General Barr on the 22nd of March. So there it is again, 22. Some it's, people would say, oh, coincidence. And it may be. Maybe it's a coincidence. But how many coincidences do you need to get your attention? In fact, God gets our attention through the number that appears at the oddest possible moment. Uh, a number of people uh, on, have seen, uh, well, for example, the number 1111. I've had people email me and, and say, I keep seeing the number 1111 on, on a clock. Every time I look at a, at a clock, it happens to be on 1111. And it's amazing how often we see that. Is that just coincidence or is that somebody trying to tell us something or what should we believe? 
Well, from the Bible, 11 is the number of chaos. It's 12 minus 1. 12 is order. You take 1 away from order, you have disorder and chaos. And this is why you have September 11. It's the number of chaos. Um, so a lot of, a lot of things happen on the 11th or uh, 11th day or 11th month that is chaotic. So uh, it might be God getting their attention. Depends on that person. It's like a dream. You cannot just do a, you know, a generalization for everybody. But the number 11 itself is speaking of chaos. Like so a warning. I mean, it's a warning. given the state of today's civilization, 1111 seems perfectly appropriate. It sure does. You've written a, a number of things that, and I use the word number lightly there, that I've never thought of. And one of the things that's amazing is, uh, and, and by the way, I've read these two volumes, and I'm going to go back and read them again. But one of the things that uh, Steve has done is link numbers to Jesus. How many numbers point to Jesus, and how do they do it? Well, we covered two already, and we've covered seven. Maybe we can delve into some of the more complicated numbers. Um, the Jewish rabbis do this. They study numbers um, as well as the letters, because the letters in Hebrew are the numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers are letters, letters are number in Hebrew. But we miss that in English. So maybe some of the audience might know that um, the tetragrammaton, the yud he vav he, mm -hmm. name of God, spells 26. That's the numerical value. All right. But a lot of people don't believe that Jesus is divine. They don't believe in the deity of the Lord. But there is a numerical clue that's been given. The name of Jesus is Yeshua in Hebrew, or Yeshu, as they're calling him. They take the ayin away, and it's supposed to be derogatory, but most Jews today, without knowing the religious background, would just know Jesus as Yeshu. Well, what is the gematrio value of Yeshu? It's 316. Now, get this. 26 is God. Miriam, which is the Hebrew name for Mary, is 290. Now keep that in mind, 26 and 290. It's a clue that he is the Messiah and he is the Son of God and he is truly divine. Now that's not a fact that you can hammer someone with and say, see here, and they can say back to you, well, that's your interpretation, I don't believe that. But on the other hand, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, that is an amazing fact. Sure. It, it makes you stop and think. Well, you can't make anyone believe anything, but God will persuade us with evidence. And the Jews, remember, the Bible says the Jews require signs. The word sign isn't just about healings and miracles. The word sign is these numerical signs are the things that convince many Jewish believers. In fact, uh, I know a couple of Jewish people who studied these numbers and came to the conclusion on their own, without any Christian sermon or church involved, that Yeshua must be the Messiah. I show you another one. This is the way the Jews think. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just that it's a different culture and a different way of thinking. The number for Messiah or Mashiach is 358. It's the Mem, Shin, Yod, Het. That's 358. Well, in rabbinic thinking, they want to study words that have the equivalent numerical value. And what else is 358? It's Goshen. Goshen is also 358. And guess what? The Messiah is among the Gentiles. The Messiah can be found in the pastoral district of Egypt, in the church. Today, the Jewish Messiah is embraced more in Goshen than in Israel. So if you're a Jew and you want to know who is the Messiah, what is the true identity of the Messiah, 358 is his identity, and Goshen is the place where he may be found. You need to go and seek him in that pastoral district. So that kind of clue it may not seem to convince many Gentiles, but it's very persuasive to a Jewish, Jewish audience because they really respect their language and they know their language is more than just words, it's also numbers. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I've had first-hand dealings with people who think this way. Uh, I've, I've spoken with, with many Jews who uh, really can't separate in their mind numbers from letters. Because each number is, uh, each letter is a number, and each number is a letter. And I, if you think about this, we as English speakers don't have that at all. But if we did, I think we'd be a lot more conscious uh, of the meaning of numbers and the uh, import and the connections that are made. 
And that's the beauty of studying the Bible. It's a multi-leveled uh, book. You were saying to me that you think that even the numbers are not just linear. You think that there's a, maybe even three dimensions to the numbers and the codes. Given my studies over the years, I've, I've come to see the Bible as a kind of a sphere, if you will. It, it, it almost uh, uh, clear, but it's covered with letters and numbers. And if you hold it just right and look through in the right direction, you can see a, a line that is, that is made up of numbers and letters, and you say, aha, this means this. But it can't be seen if you turn it slightly. In other words, you have to know how to look, how to orient yourself to pick up the meanings. And that's what I like about you. You have, for whatever reason, uh, oriented your thinking to being sensitive to those numbers, and you've brought it to us in your books, which, by the way, is uh, very unusual. And yeah, we appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yeah, I try to cover, I know that historically there's been um, Bollinger's book and, and other people's books, but I try to expand on, on some of the numbers that haven't been covered yet. And I just think all of it points to God. All of it points to the, the, the wonderful, splendid uh, Savior who's come to save the world. And we need to make Him known. And whichever way we can reach people uh, through all their different cultures and education and background, we should use those those ways. Let's talk about a number that everybody knows. If you, if you walk up to somebody who's just mildly acquainted with the Bible and say, have you ever heard of the number 666? They would say, oh yeah, Mark of the Beast. I know that number. Everybody knows that number. And you've uh, written a couple of things about the Mark of the Beast. 666, what, what's going on there? Well, the way that the Jews would understand that is uh, we're given an invitation to look into the gematria, to look yeah. into the numbers. That's what Revelation 13 is clearly telling the Christians. But we're a bit unfamiliar with that. The Hebrew mind would completely understand. So the first level of understanding would be to seek the name of the person whose numerical value equals 666. And I think it needs to be done in the original languages of the Bible. So it's either Greek or Hebrew. Now some people try to do it in English and all that, and I think that's, that's going too far. I remember People once said Ronald Reagan must be the Antichrist because Ronald Wilson Reagan, each name has six letters. And I, to me, that's a poor way to right. interpret the Bible. That's, and that's certainly not a Hebraic way of understanding it. So for the first century Christians, they were convinced that Nero, uh, Nero Kaiser, or Emperor Nero, was the Antichrist. And certainly he was to them. He was the great persecutor of Christianity. And his name, Emperor Nero, equaled 666. But I believe that there are multiple fulfillments of the scriptures. And there will be an ultimate antichrist or an anti-Semitic leader who's going to come up and his name is going to add up to 666. And I've read the history of Nero and the, the, uh, the fact that he's a kind of a mysterious guy. He shows up, <clears throat> manifests maximum power, and then he's gone. And he, he leaves in such a way that People wonder, is he really dead or is he still alive? And <clears throat> there was the thought in, uh, in, in his day, if you check history, that he sort of disappeared, but he was coming back. That's, that's what people were saying about him. He, he's not gone yet. He'll be back. He'll be back. And there was this aura around Nero that he would come back and, and resume power someday. And, and to me, he's the perfect type of the Antichrist. Well, you know, there's somebody who's actually... Uh, gotten is a symbol of peace and gotten the Nobel Peace Prize and he's disappeared and yet he lives in Washington and many people expect he might be coming back. But you can't say that for sure. We don't know for sure. It, but it stimulates your thinking because uh, the way the Lord thinks expressed both in letters and numbers is unique. And once you sensitize yourself to it, it's, uh, it's remarkable. And that's exactly what these volumes have done. Do you have any other favorite numbers you'd like to talk about? We're going out today. We, we have a few minutes left. What, what really stimulates you? What are you working on now? Or what are you thinking about in terms of biblical numbers? Well, I think there's another great clue about uh, the identity of the Messiah in uh, number 446. So the uh, numerical value of the word death, death in Hebrew, is 446. And the numeric value of truth is also 446. Hmm. Now, to a rabbinic mind, there's a connection. That's an invitation to study. What's going on there? 
And for us, with the light of the New Testament, we know for sure that Jesus' death is the central truth to human history. And so God is putting the clue in the Hebrew language. If any, any Jewish mind is seeking for the Messiah, he can know that, okay, well, what is the truth? I want to know the truth in my life. I don't want to live a life of lies and deception. Well, the truth has the same value as death. Why is that? Because his death brought us life. It's an amazing connection. Hmm. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and there you have it. That's right. Now, but that's very interesting. And somebody might say, well, I think maybe, you, uh, Steve, maybe you're just a little too imaginative there. Are you, do you really have proof that that means what it means? Well, it goes even further than that. If you want, 446 is also the numeric value of bitter herbs, meaning it's going to be a bitter truth. It's going to be a bitter truth to accept that the central person in all of history and the central person for our life is someone who died for our sins. Hmm. That we will never have eternal life without recognizing this person is divine and he died for our sins. He paid for our suffering. So we can keep going many, many examples, but can you force someone to believe? Of course not. And we would never want to force someone to believe. But I think if you're asking God, show me who you are, he will do it through language and through numbers. Why not? He invented both. Right? It's a, actually, it's a humanist idea that, that man invented numbers. God invented numbers. That's why they're pointing to him. And <clears throat> the language he gave Moses is both letters and numbers, all in the same language. That's right. So there you go. Again, uh, Steve Ciccolante uh, has written two volumes called uh, The Divine Code. And as I read these, uh, I thought to myself, not everybody thinks this way. Uh, I think you've got a gift for whatever reason, uh, these inner insights that enable you to see things and to present them to others that they would not see for themselves. And uh, let, let's uh, kind of conclude with, with uh, a, a look into the future. Everybody is looking for the return of the Lord. Well, we'd have to go to Bible prophecy first and understand the, the plain words of the Bible, right? So we're understanding the Bible at different levels. We first have to accept the plain level, and then we can look at some of the numerical values. The most important prophecy in the entire Bible about the coming of the Lord is Daniel chapter 9. And it's a bit complicated because we don't think of weeks in terms of years, but Daniel prophesied that there will be 70 weeks of years, or 490 years, for God to deal with uh, the Jews. And that actually came because he was expecting everything to end at the end of the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. Right At 70 years was up, he was praying, he said, Lord, get us out of this oppressive regime and take us back to the promised land, then it'll be all over. And God says, no, there's sort of a delay. It's 490 years more until the Messiah, but then he divides it up into seven, and then 62, and then one. So we see that these weeks get divided. So there's a 69-week year, a 69 week period, which is 483 years. If we count 483 biblical years, which is 360 days, from the, from the trigger of what Daniel said, which is the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, and that happened in 445 B.C. with Artaxerxes' mm -hmm. um, decree, then we go straight to the 10th of Nisan, 32 A.D. That gives us a mathematically precise prediction when the Messiah would come. So if any Jew would study Daniel chapter 9, you would know you only get 483 years before your Messiah must appear. Now there's another period of seven left when he can come back and fulfill the last. And this is the thing that's interesting to me, is the way that Daniel divided it. Sir Isaac Newton said that it, it was divided because it also points to the second coming. Mm -hmm. Now this is the question is, we don't want to set dates, but maybe we can know the season. Maybe we can know roughly the area that we're in. And I think it's very exciting because if we can find another decree to rebuild Jerusalem, we could do the same calculation, which was authorized by God the first time, and see, can we get into the zone of when the second coming is? And a lot of signs are converging that we're very near. I think in the, these 2020 season, we've got a lot of things converging. And so we, I think we should live you know, fervently for Christ, tell as many people about Jesus as possible. But the question is, is there or was there another decree to rebuild Jerusalem? Because at 70 AD, 
they get dispersed, the Jews, and there's a diaspora, so the nation of Israel ceased to exist. Was there another decree? And sure enough, if you look in history, the Sultan Suleiman made a decree to rebuild Jerusalem in 1537 AD. Hmm. That means we can now go back to the math that God gave Daniel and add 483 years to 1537, and we would come to exactly 2020. That's next year. Wow. Okay. Now, if we, if we want to go <laughs> further, because it doesn't mean it's yeah. the, might not be the end, might not be Jesus coming, might be the beginning of the tribulation or the beginning of a decree to rebuild uh, the third temple, let's say. But we have another date. We have 490 years. And if we add that to 1537, it takes us to 2027. Hmm. And within that time zone, there is another great American solar eclipse that's due. And that's coming in 2024. So you can see, if, if we, can, we can just keep layering it on that the numerical clues, the divine codes, I call them, the divine codes are pointing to this season, this decade that we're about to go into. It's going to be very, very important, especially for America, because there's that solar eclipse that's coming again, that's going to cross the continental U.S. And that happened uh, in 2017, and mm -hmm. it, the last time before that was 1776. So it's definitely a prophetic warning for America. Now, you're not naming a date. You're not setting a date and say, saying something is going to happen at this time. But on the other hand, you are looking at times and seasons and kind of encouraging people by saying this might not be so far off, uh, which I think is, is something we need to do. I think we need to encourage each other, which is part of the, of the uh, I guess, the, the task that we have here at Prophecy Watchers. We want to make sure that advanced thinking uh, by by people who are moved by the Lord to study Bible prophecy will, will come to you and you'll be excited by what you hear. And I think, you know, things like we're talking about right now are very exciting. That's, to me, is uh, just two plus two, to use a couple of numbers. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, this exposition of Daniel's prophecy, you know, I've never really heard that before, but it makes sense. It, it really does. Yeah, prophecy gets fulfilled multiple times. That's why there is a first coming and a second coming. It might have seemed confusing back in the first century, but with 2,000 years of hindsight, we know the Bible can be fulfilled multiple times. So the multiple interpretations can actually all be correct, and people are fighting over nothing. So I think uh, there's definitely a clue to the time we're living in that we're getting close to the coming of the Lord. His name is Steve Ciccolanti, and uh, he has written The Divine Code, Volumes 1 and 2, which I'm holding. And uh, we're offering uh, these uh, two books to you, uh, these two volumes, at $25 each. Go to the Prophecy Watchers online bookstore, uh, prophecywatchers.tv. Click on the bookstore and scroll down and you'll find The Divine Code package. These two books, $25 each, uh, will come with a free bonus. <clears throat> this is Hidden Treasures in the Biblical Text by Chuck Missler. And, and Chuck talks a lot about this sort of thinking. And uh, these three books make a remarkable combination for you. Uh, the two books, $25 each, with the free bonus, uh, you've got all three for $50. Free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Again, that's prophecywatchers.tv. Click on the online bookstore, scroll down, and you'll find this package, the Divine Code package. And uh, his name is Steve Ciccolante, which, by the way, <clears throat> sounds Italian, but it's really Australian. <laughs> no, it's Italian. It's true. It <laughs> yeah, means... You, you happen to live in Melbourne, Australia, and... and uh, Preaching, what's it like to preach in Melbourne, Australia? Uh, it, what is the, uh, if you will, the, the social climate, is the acceptance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's become a very secular country, and uh, our state has actually had a lot of problems of uh, anti-Christian bigotry, uh, even in um, the top levels of government, you know. Uh, they propose things that are very anti-scripture mm. and anti-Christian value. They want to take away gender from the birth certificate. Mm. They want to have children go into transgender bathrooms. And I don't know why this is so important to them right now, because actually the standard of education is declining in our state and in Australia in general. So they should be focusing on English and math and science, but instead they're doing the social engineering, which uh, has always been historically part of the, the left-wing movement. So we're in the middle of that. 
we are uh, optimistic that we're reaching people and that programs like these and through the internet we're reaching people with the truth. But I believe that's why the Lord put me and our church there to be a light, to be a light and to be salt. So we believe revival is coming. We believe a great awakening is coming. And that's why we got to press on and keep preaching the gospel and teaching the word of God. You know, a lot of people are saying, no, we've, we've seen our last great awakening. Everything is, is getting darker. Everything is sinking. Even in the United States, uh, m- much of the gospel in many of the institutions of the United States are simply inimical to the people who are in control today. And so a lot of people are, are saying, no, there cannot be another great awakening. You're saying you're I hoping for one. I'm not hoping for one. I am going to be part of one. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. There has to be. And I think that there's been given some reprieve and respite, uh, even with the, all of the progress being made with the pro-life um, movement and the heartbeat bills that are being passed in Alabama, Missouri, Louisiana. These give us uh, not just hope, but clear evidence God is moving in this country again. And people have to wake up and people have to pray and preach the gospel again. We've kind of left it to the maybe the mega church pastors for too long. It's time for Christians to rise up and be Christian. And I think prophecy stirs us up. Steve Ciccolanti, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. Come back and visit us soon. And say hi to everybody in Melbourne for us. I'll say to everybody. I'll make sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been good talking with you. I'm Gary Stearman. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I have. And I want you to keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.